Rupert Murdoch stepping down as chair of News Corp and Fox has prompted an assessment of his long career. This was Owen Jones' take on Sky News. How do you think Rupert Murdoch's going to be remembered? Well, he's the, Rupert Murdoch is the most poisonous individual of my lifetime. Uh, 20 years ago, just as an example, on the road to war in Iraq, um, Rupert Murdoch owns 175 newspapers all around the world, and all 175 newspapers backed the Iraq war. They softened up public opinion for what was a calamity which took the lives of hundreds of thousands of people and unleashed terrible blood and chaos. And why do I mention that? Uh, because it shows that the idea that we have this free press uh, with all, all these newspaper outlets and media outlets he ran full of rigorous journalism, coincidentally, all backed this catas catastrophic war. Many other examples, though, in the 1980s, when the bodies of hundreds of thousands of gay men were being ravaged by AIDS all over the world, his newspapers whipped up the most vile bigotry against gay men. If you think about the United States, uh, we mentioned uh, Fox News, their peddling of conspiratorial nonsense about the Obama administration, the Islamophobia, that paved the way for Donald Trump, who he spoke to every single week when he was president. Or if you think about the climate emergency, spreading climate denialism about what is an existential threat to human civilization, his attacks on migrants, refugees. So you're, you're, you're a big fan then, right? Well, huge yeah. fan. But I think it's really important we say this yeah. because this isn't just some media owner. This guy is a politician. He's a very, very powerful political figure who has, without being elected by a single person, had a huge disruptive and pernicious and poisonous impact in our democracy, Australian democracy, US democracy, and democracies all over the world. Well, that's very well put, as usual, by Owen Jones. Aaron, I really wanted your thoughts on, on, on Murdoch resigning. I know you have a lot of thoughts about Rupert Murdoch, often quite a lot of anecdotes as well from various books you've read. What are your sort of principal thoughts um, on the week he has stood down as chair of News Corp? Well, it's very alluring when you're on the left to talk about structures and to talk about big trends and historical inevitability and materialism and blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, they didn't do this. It was broader factors at play, blah, blah, blah. With Rupert Murdoch, it's something of an exception, Michael. Rupert Murdoch, as an individual, I think, played a greater role than probably anybody else in the pernicious politics of greed and effectively theft, which have come to characterize the Anglo-American economies over the last 40 years. You know, he, he entered this country in 1969. He buys News of the World. He buys The Sun. He buys a bunch of other outlets, too. Um, he bought The Sun, by the way, which until then had been a Labour-supporting newspaper, so hard to believe. Uh, he promised that they would always back the Labour Party. Of course, that promise didn't last very long. Here is one story which I think tells you a great deal about the kind of man he is, the kind of operations he ran, and the extent to which they transformed British media and public life. He had an editor of The Sun, Larry Lamb. He was the editor of uh, The Sun twice. When I say Larry Lamb, it's not George Lamb's dad, that handsome older gentleman who goes on, you know, occasional TV dramas, different chap who's now passed away. Uh, he was Murdoch's first editor at The Sun. He leaves for a few years. I think he comes back in, I think, maybe 75. And he, he stays all the way through to the early 1980s. Now, Larry Lamb, um, after 1977, started to write, write speeches for Margaret Thatcher, who at that point, of course, was leading the opposition. So the editor of The Sun was writing speeches for the leader of the opposition. Not just talking to them, or just interviewing them, writing the speeches, okay? Uh, people like um, Adam Bolton, who was defending uh, Rupert Murdoch, of course, he was previously an employee of Rupert Murdoch, they like to say, well, he's just reflecting the, their audience, and uh, you just don't like working-class Britain. That, that, that's what they think. You like to blame Murdoch instead. Well, that doesn't really make much sense when Larry Lamb is both reporting on a speech and writing it. What that means, Adam, is that they don't have respect for their readers. They, they think they're suckers. They think they can propagandize them and that their readers are idiots. They think their readers are idiots, right, frankly, if they're doing that. So he writes speeches for, for Lady Thatcher um, from 77 onwards. On the day of the election in 1979, where, of course, Margaret Thatcher comes to office, she enters 10 Downing Street, Labour are booted out. Jim Callaghan is, you know, is out on his backside. On the day of the 1979 general election, this is in The Sun, remember. Larry Lamb writes a 1,600-word piece about why Sun readers should vote for the Tories. 1,600 words, okay? This isn't the London Review of Books. This isn't Book Forum. This isn't an economist special issue. This is The Sun newspaper. The editor writes a 1,600-word piece about why 
their readers should go and vote for the Tories, who he's been writing speeches for for the last two years. Who do you think gets a knighthood in the Queen's birthday honours, 1980? Larry Lamb. So what you have is a profound corruption and venality injected into British public life as a result of Rupert Murdoch entering this country's media environment. I, I think he is an extraordinarily unique and toxic and malevolent presence in it. Um, like I say, that one incident, that one story of Larry Lamb, uh, of the, the fusion of politics and media, of effectively corruption, of effectively misleading and lying to your readers by default, and treating journalism as an extension of propaganda, uh, that was very unusual before Rupert Murdoch entered Britain. Uh, and it's now the norm. And he's a major reason why. That will be one of the main legacies, right? Undermining democracy, debasing politics. The other, I think, will be the serious damage he did to the fight against climate change, right? So the decision by Fox News in the mid 2000s to say, oh, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to cast doubt on this. You know, you'd had the Al Gore movie out. There was a growing sort of consensus that climate change was a real threat, that we needed to take early action so that we wouldn't have to face catastrophe down the line. Rupert Murdoch, you know, almost single mindedly sort of decides, nope, we're not having any of this. We are going to give wall to wall coverage of climate skepticism. Then that obviously sort of takes over. Well, I mean, it's, it's not as if George W. Bush needed any sort of encouragement to be a climate skeptic, but you have this huge block of the American right-wing press and right-wing leaders sort of being massive opponents of any kind of climate action. Obviously, if we'd taken this action in, in the early noughties, it would be so much cheaper. It would be so much easier. We wouldn't be having the same kind of extreme weather we're seeing now. And getting to net zero by 2050 would have been a piece of piss. It would have been really easy. It's going to be quite difficult now because we left it so long. I think in Australia, it's even more dramatic because there, what you had was, was politicians who were planning to take some kind of climate action. So Kevin Rudd was a, a Labour prime minister. He was going to introduce a carbon tax. Then the Murdoch press, they actually owned two thirds um, of the newspapers in Australia, so even more than they do in the UK, a sort of single-minded campaign against him, he ends up having to resign. It's similar to what you were saying, Aaron. It's almost difficult to comprehend sort of the 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 personal culpability that someone can have that sort of is 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 separate from sort of structural forces. Obviously, under capitalism, it was always going to be very difficult to deal with climate change of all these vested interests who who don't want you to to tax carbon, who don't want you to sort of try and move away from, from from fossil fuels. Lots of vested interests involved. It was always going to be difficult, but it didn't need to be as difficult as it was. And one of the reasons was Rupert Murdoch. That's entirely right, Michael. And I think, you know, in a broader, in a broader sense, that is his primary legacy. You know, he, he probably slowed down responding to climate change in the Anglo-American economies by several decades. Today, you know, we talk about British emissions, how high they are. Of course, you know, the Tories love to say how much they've fallen in recent years, and they are quite low. Um, I think the CO2 emissions per head about twice what they are in this country, in Australia, twice what they are in this country, in Canada, and twice what they are in this country, in the United States. You know, the English speaking world is doing appallingly. Britain is, you know, the, 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 the best in class when it comes to English speaking countries. And Australia, Michael, you have a country of what, 30 million people, immense solar potential, uh, and yet they're producing twice the CO2, they don't need to heat their homes, it's a very warm country, yet they're producing twice the CO2 emissions that Britain does. I mean, that's absolutely extraordinary. And Australian politicians, will, they'll point to China. They haven't got a leg to stand on. They just haven't got a leg to stand on. Um, and also with the United States, Michael, you know, the creation of Fox News in the early 1990s is a game changer in the political culture of that country. Of course you have Republicans before then. Of course you have Reaganism. Nobody's saying that somehow America was a utopia before then. But if you look at the tenor and the standard of debate, even in, you know, the 84, 88 elections, compare it to what it became really within 10 years, 15 years. Um, the attacks, for instance, you saw on um, John Kerry with regards to his military record and whatnot. Um, extraordinary. I think, frankly, the, um, the 2000 election was, was stolen. We don't talk about that nearly enough. Fox News played a central role in that. Um, and, you know, there, there are various other players in this story. We can talk about Tucker Carlson or we can talk about um, you know, the gentleman who was basically at the top of Fox for years working on behalf of, uh, of Rupert Murdoch. But those are pieces on a chessboard for Mr. Murdoch. If you were to say the single worst thing he did is clearly the creation of Fox News in the United States. And the extent to which that has shaped and warped how we under understand news more broadly, Michael, really can't be understated. You know, this idea of the, the ticker 
going at the bottom of your screen with breaking news. You know, that was innovated by Fox News on the day of the 9-11 attacks. And by the way, they weren't the number one news network in the United States until the 9-11 attacks. They weren't. What that did, that foreign policy agenda, the war on terror, Bush, what it gave them all of a sudden was a, a, a sequence and a set of talking points and fundamentally fear-mongering, which, which was for them great content. And it, it got them to the top of the charts, you know, bigger than MSNBC, bigger than CNN. Um, and, and that was a hugely destructive thing for the United States. You know, I think, I think really in the next several decades, the United States, if it doesn't slide into civil war, and I don't think it will, but I think it will slide into something like civil warfare, which is to say constant low level, um, you know, conflagrations. Uh, you know, we're looking at election in 2024, Michael. Whoever wins, 30 to 40 percent of the U.S. electorate will say it's been stolen. You know, that whole environment is a result of Fox News, I would I would argue. Of course, conservatism existed before that. Climate denialism existed before that. But it has warped and transformed. Um, the common sense of English speaking politics so much, uh, I think it's almost, it's, it's hard to get your head around. And when the man dies, I don't say this about many people, by the way, when the man dies, it'll be, it will be a fantastic day for humanity. Okay. You should, of course, never say that about somebody, but it will be a fantastic day for humanity because, like you say, the choices made by him and his companies 20, 30, 40 years ago have locked in millions of deaths when it comes to climate change. I don't like to overly dramatize with this stuff. And, you know, because uh, the left kind of has a reputation for doing that. So you try and be somber, you try and be analytical. I think those are the facts, actually. I think when there is an accounting of political failure by the planet, um, looking back on the 20th and 21st centuries, you know, that guy, when you're looking at the worst characters, I mean, he's, I think he's pretty much at the top. Rupert Murdoch's legacy, of course, will be to make the media even more in the interest of billionaires than it ever was. I mean, we didn't really have billionaires when he was buying those newspapers, was it? But he shifted the media to be more and more in favour of the rich and powerful. We're, of course, trying to do the opposite. Um, what do we need to keep doing that? We need more support from you guys. We are people-powered media. Um, we are funded by our viewers, not by billionaire oil barons. And next year is going to be a pretty big year. Uh, general election in this country, presidential election in the United States, we really do want to get 5,000 extra supporters. Um, so if you aren't already a supporter, please do sign up at navaramediate.com slash support. We ask for the equivalent of one hour's wage a month or whatever you can afford. Um, the link is is in the description. If you look on social media today, you'll also see we've we've got a launch video for our fundraiser. So so go and share that and encourage other people to sign up. 